On September 2, 1724, a young woman named Margaret Dixon faced a crowd of onlookers booing her. Excited to see her fall to her death, hanged on a gibbet located in the grass market in Edinburgh. However, about an hour after Miggy was declared dead and lying in a coffin, making her way to Musselboro to be buried by her family, she woke up. Maggie Dixon lived a simple life as a fish hawker in one of Scotland's oldest seaside towns, Musselboro. She lived happily alongside her husband until one day he vanished seemingly deserting her, leaving Maggie to fend for herself. No one truly knows where her husband went, so it is a bit of a mystery, but numerous theories have been speculated, including being forced to join the Royal Navy, or that he moved away to find work in another town. However, his absence left Maggie poor and almost destitute. In order to survive, Maggie was forced to move to a small town named Kelso, near the River Tweed where her fate truly changed forever. Maggie took a job at an inn and worked as a domestic in exchange for lodgings. While working and living in Kelso, Maggie took a liking for the innkeeper's son and became pregnant with his child. Now while her husband did desert her, she was technically still married, and the baby was considered illegitimate as he was born from an affair. And back in the 1700s, this was not okay. Women were humiliated and treated as outcasts in town, losing friends and being disowned by family. Not only that, but they were even forced to sit in specific chairs in church so people would know who to humiliate and judge. It was a good time. So women would hide their pregnancies and destroy their babies in secret, which is exactly what happened to Maggie. To avoid losing her job, Maggie attempted to hide her pregnancy. But the changes to her body became obvious, and the rumors of her being pregnant from adultery spread around Kelso. So when the body of a dead infant turned up on the banks of the River Tweed, it was pretty easy to trace the crime back to Maggie. She finally admitted that the baby was hers, but she said he was born prematurely and didn't have time to get to a midwife for assistance. Even if she did get assistance with her baby's birth, Maggie said he was still born she knew she had to dispose of the baby's body. Distraught, she brought her baby to the River Tweed to send his body down the river as her form of burial. However, it is claimed that she couldn't bring herself to put her baby in the river and left the body on the river bank instead. While no one is certain what happened, some people speculated that she drowned her child. Even doctors at the time, using very inaccurate tools, stated that the baby had been alive because he had water in his lungs. This wasn't enough evidence to convict her of infanticide, but she was still charged with the crime of concealing her pregnancy. Maggie was convicted by an all-male jury and charged under Concealment of Pregnancy Act for hiding the pregnancy and birth of her child. Both were considered capital crimes. Her sentence? To be hanged to death. She was sent to the old Tollbooth prison in Edinburgh, which is infamous for its horrific conditions. A lot of criminals were chained to the wall, and prisoners would often die within quite regularly. Maggie did end up confessing to hiding her pregnancy while in prison, however she was adamant about her innocence in the death of her child. None of this mattered though, and on a cold September morning in 1724, Maggie was brought to the gibbet located in Edinburgh's grass market. She made the long walk from the Tollbooth prison towards the grass market to meet her grisly end. The grass market was packed with people, excitedly chanting with each other, waiting to throw stones and yell at the criminals about to be hanged. Walking through the chanting and the humiliation of people taunting her, Maggie made her way to the gibbet and under the ominous shadow of the nearby Edinburgh castle, the hangman's noose was wrapped around her neck and she dropped to her death. However, Maggie didn't die, at least not right away. Most people will die from a broken neck once their body drops, but on occasion, people will survive the fall and hang until they finally die. Usually, this will happen when the rope is too short to cause enough force on the drop to cause death, which is a horrible way to die. It isn't certain if this is what happened during Maggie's execution, 
but there are many speculations as to what happened to cause her prolonged survival. Some people say she seduced the hangman, and he loosened her rope so she wouldn't break her neck in the fall. Others say the hangman forgot to tie her hands before hanging her, allowing her to slide her hands between the rope and her neck, causing her to survive the drop. No one truly knows, but it is said that they removed her hands, and she hung freely for 30 minutes before being cut down and taken away in a coffin to be buried by her family. I have a few theories about her survival, including being hanged on a short rope, which would cause injuries but not necessarily death, or she may have fainted, which could be why she was pronounced dead. No offense to the medical doctors of the 1700s, but their practice and medical experience weren't very reliable. Now this isn't why she's known as the woman who survived being hanged, nor is it how she got the nickname Half-Hanged Maggie. Once she was hanged, she had to stay hanging for 30 minutes before she was officially pronounced dead and then sent on her way to her burial. She gained her nickname because an hour after she was hanged, she woke up on the back of a carriage in a wooden coffin. Now there have been stories that Maggie's family had to fight to keep her body so they could bury her in her hometown of Musselboro. Uh, Edinburgh is known for being a city with incredible medical history and has renowned medical and anatomy schools that would bring in students from all over the world. The problem with being so popular is the anatomy schools had trouble getting their hands on fresh cadavers that they could use to further learn about the human body. Many anatomy classes only had access to bodies once or twice a year when criminals' bodies were donated to the schools, which was not enough for the high demand by students. So over the years, people have claimed that medical students were desperate to claim Maggie's body to take to Edinburgh's anatomy school for dissection. In Scotland, most people refused to donate their bodies to science, so the anatomy schools would rarely get a chance to dissect bodies and were desperate to get their hands on a fresh corpse. In an attempt to gain access to more bodies, things like grave robbing was prevalent. To combat this, watchtowers were placed in graveyards so families could stay and watch over the grave of their loved ones to keep them safe from body snatchers. Other security measures like mort safes were also used. A mort safe is an iron cage placed over a grave to prevent anyone from gaining access to bodies. Another thing that occurred is that a family would hold onto the body of their past family member until the body started to decompose before burying them. Eventually, grave robbing became a crime in 1832 with the new anatomy bill. So did this happen to Maggie? Were medical students desperately fighting to get her body so they could dissect her corpse? And if this is the story, why were they fighting her family? As a criminal, her family wouldn't have had the chance to decide, and her body would have been donated anyway. I felt like the timing was off, so I decided to look deeper to find the truth behind these rumors. Maggie was hanged in 1724, and the first medical school didn't open in Edinburgh until 1726. Not only that, but it is one of the oldest medical schools in the world, and the oldest medical school in the United Kingdom. Without an anatomy school nearby, there is a very slim chance these rumors are true. I found an article by the Surgeons Hall Museums that confirmed my suspicions, and they agree that the story about anatomy students fighting to access Maggie's body is not likely. I think that over the years, tour guides and storytellers would add more information to Maggie's story to make it seem more exciting. If you're into medical history or dark history, you will know that Edinburgh is known for grave robbing and that the anatomy schools got cadavers in very shady ways. After all, in Edinburgh, it is well known that a doctor named Robert Knox would purchase bodies from two men named Burke and Hare. They would lure the victims in, suffocate them, then bring the body to Dr. Knox the next day. He paid them handsomely until they were caught. I feel that the history was thrown in with Maggie but they didn't look into the years that anatomy schools existed in Edinburgh, so they just threw it in to make her story a little bit more interesting. Now, back to Maggie waking up from the dead. Once loaded into a coffin and put onto a cart, Maggie was sent on her way to Musselboro from Edinburgh when they stopped at a nearby pub for food and drinks. The pub they stopped at was called the Sheephead Inn and still stands today. 
It's located in Duddingston in the Peppermill area and has been standing since the 1300s. Noises and movement were noticed coming from within the thin wooden coffin and the driver of the cart went to investigate and noticed Maggie was trying to get out of the coffin. Apparently, Maggie was jostled back to life due to the bumpy conditions of the road between Edinburgh and Musselburgh, causing her to awaken from death. Maggie was injured by the hanging. She had neck problems, known as a hangman's fracture, and possibly had a broken vertebrae. So she spent the night at the inn and felt well enough to walk herself to Musselburgh the next day where she could fully heal before being brought back to Edinburgh to face the courts. The council was shocked she was alive, but according to laws in Scotland, she was blessed with divine intervention and was pardoned. At the time, the laws in Scotland said that she could not legally be punished twice for the same crime. However, after her survival, judges in Scotland changed the terms of the sentence from hanged to hanged until dead so this would never happen again. Once pardoned, Maggie lived for another 40 or so years. She reunited with her husband, had several kids, and ran her own ale house. Her legacy and memory are still told today. She now has a pub with her namesake in Edinburgh's grass market with a stone marker where the gallows once stood. And the shadow of the gibbet, now made of dark stone, leads you towards the Maggie Dixon pub. There are so many versions of her story, it can be hard to decide what is fact and what is made up by the storytelling over the years. People love to embellish certain things about her life to make her story seem darker than they really were. However, she was a real woman whose partial death led to the law being changed in Scotland, and her legacy still lives on in Edinburgh 300 years later. Thank you so much for listening to Everything is Spooky in the Dark, the podcast from WanderingCrystal.com. If you want to know more about Maggie or other dark history around Scotland, be sure to visit the blog and say hello. Bye!